this thing in first class where you follow Hollywood rules and you don't talk to people unless you're spoken to and, and that kind of thing. And, and pretty much everybody up there is, um, you know, they're there mainly not for the first class service, but so they don't have to sit with you. So um, <laughs> the seat will turn into a lie flat bed. Uh, it's often configured as an enclosed suite. So you actually like, you know, you, your plane seat is kind of like a little apartment. Uh, the, there's caviar, there's champagne, there's, you know, basically everything billionaires expect uh, on a private jet. You, you know, private jets aren't practical for extremely long distance travel. And so like, those are the kinds of people that you'll find in first class uh, and their tastes are catered to. Uh, and, you know, there's even on uh, Emirates an, an in-flight shower. Like, it's kind of a gimmick. You, can, you only get five minutes. Uh, but that's a bucket list item for some people. Uh, and it is something that you could possibly do. Like, uh, if you guys know who Casey Neistat is, he's done, like, a video on the in-flight shower on, uh, on Emirates. And it's, even though I can't stand the guy, like, his, his video on the in-flight shower is pretty good. Um, so how do you get this stuff? Well, you need to accumulate currency. And there are a couple of different kinds of currency you can accumulate. You can either become a billionaire and have a billion dollars. Uh, so it's not a big deal to drop you know, the price of a car on a flight. Or you can start accumulating some points. Because airlines make a very small number of these experiences available to people like you and me. They would prefer not to. But they do to maintain credibility in their airline frequent flyer programs. And if you are able to accumulate enough of these points, then you can do that too. Uh, and so there are three primary currencies that you can accumulate in order to buy flights out of frequent flyer programs. They're airline points. And so those are things like Alaska Airlines Mileage Plan Miles, Delta Sky Miles, or United Mileage Plus. There's hotel points. And the best ones uh, right now are Marriott hotel points. So if you travel for business a lot and you have a choice of where to stay, you could start banking a bunch of Marriott hotel points. And I can actually use those for flights. Uh, and then credit card points. And so does anybody have an American Express card that has points or a Chase card or anything like that? OK, so a couple of people. So those points I can use. Uh, so the, most of those airline, most of those bank points, they try to steer you to spending them, them unoptimally. You know, they want you to buy gift cards with them or um, use them for like booking travel on a portal at one cent per point. Well, I can do way more than that, and you can too, uh, by transferring those points into airline programs. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that works uh, and how we score some of these uh, awards at AwardCat. So transferable points, these kinds of points, the, the big ones are American Express membership rewards. Uh, Chase Ultimate Rewards. You get those with the Sapphire Preferred or the Sapphire Reserve or, or some of their business cards. Uh, there's some new points that Capital One has uh, in the, the Capital One Venture Program, and those are transferable as well. And then Citi, who isn't very big in the Pacific Northwest, has some points called Thank You Points. And those points transfer to different airlines as well. And so why would you want to go with transferable points uh, as opposed to you know just banking with your favorite airline? Like if you fly with Alaska a lot, like why not just only do Alaska Airlines mileage plan and focus on that? Well, those are great points. But if you do transferable points, you can get flights on Alaska Airlines through some other airline programs that are partner. And what it gives you is more optionality because you're able to flexibly transfer those points into multiple airlines. And so that'll allow you to do things like, you know, fly United on the outbound and, you know, fly Alaska on the return, for example. Um, you could do, it gives you more options for scarce inventory. So if you're trying to travel during tough dates, you know, it's really hard to find a round trip. Like it's hard enough to find one direction on a given airline let alone a round trip around a date like uh, Thanksgiving, for example. So if you can split it up and like do one airline one way and the other the other, that gives you a lot more options. Uh, and this is also true for booking you know, first in business class. That can be really tough to do. Uh, you, know, you can use foreign airline programs with better redemption rates. So a lot of these banks you know, partner with crazy airline programs you've never heard of, like, like Avianca Life Miles. They're a Colombian airline. Uh, you know, I flew from South Africa back to here using points from, you know, a Colombian airline. Like, it, you know, 
I didn't really believe that I actually had a ticket until the the boarding pass is printed out. But you know, it's it does work, and um, you, you know you can. And it was ridiculously cheap. In fact, their IT is so bad they never charged me for that flight. So <laughs> they charged me the cash for the tax, but they forgot to take the points. So. Uh, anyway, um, so you can and you can uh, take advantage of some sweet spots in these uh, airline award charts as well. So every program has you know benefits and drawbacks. There are some really good awards and there are some terrible ways to spend the points. And so if you have more options to be able to transfer to, you can basically stretch more value out of your points. So, uh, what kinds of transferable points? I, I went over that a little bit. American Express membership rewards, you would get those with a platinum card, a gold card, many of their business cards. Uh, and so those points, trans I like them a lot because they transfer to a very large number of airline partners that are pretty good, including Avianca Life Miles now. That's a fairly new one. Uh, City Thank You Points, so that's another Avianca Life Miles partner. Uh, and those, you know, there's a new card that they that they kind of rebooted uh, that you can get a lot of thank you points through. So yeah, it's called the City Thank You Premier. Uh, these cards have very high annual fees fairly often. It's you're, you're shelling out $500 a year to carry one. Uh, but the flip side of it is you're getting maybe $5,000 a year worth of points. So if you're smart in how you use the points, the annual fee definitely can pay for itself. You just need to be careful to crunch the numbers because it doesn't always do that. Uh, Chase Ultimate Rewards Points. Uh, my favorite card to get these is the Chase Sapphire Reserve. It has a $450 annual fee. I carry that card, but it gives you three times points on all your travel and all your dining. And travel includes good to go, tolls, uh, parking. You know, it's a, they have a very expansive def definition of what's travel and, and what's dining. So. Uh, triple points, you know, kind of a no-brainer. I get the, I get that value back very easily every year, uh, and they do rebate three hundred dollars of it when you spend it on travel. So go buy one plane ticket, and you know, basically that knocks the effective annual fee down to one hundred and fifty dollars a year. Uh, Capital One uh, Venture Rewards. That's a fairly new category of points. Uh, they've got some terrible airline partners and a couple of good ones, but they're you know a good transferable points option. You might as well grab them. Uh, HSBC, if you have more than $100,000 to put with HSBC, you can get a Premier card uh, and you can you know, move over your retirement account, which is what I did to be able to get this. Uh, if you do that, they'll open bank accounts all over the world for you in different HSBCs. You can transfer money um, between them with no fees uh, and they give you a card that has transferable points uh, to Singapore or to British Airline, uh, Airways. So that's. You know, it's if you're kind of in a place where you can park some of your retirement uh, money with HSBC, then that might be something uh, worth considering. And then finally, Marriott. Like, no, it's not only banks that have transferable points. Hotel points can transfer to airlines too. The best ones to do that with are Marriott. But you have to pay attention when you're buying tickets through an airline program around what the transfer times and the inventory risk are. Uh, when you want to use these points. And so what is that? Uh, so if I want to get a ticket with an airline program, and later on in the talk, we're actually going to do some of this live. So you, got, you can see how it works, and hopefully somebody wants to take a trip and we'll be able to book it. Uh, but when I go look for inventory, that inventory doesn't stick around. There might be one seat per day on a flight, or two, possibly. And so if it takes three days to move your points out of a bank into the airline, by the time that they get over there, that, that seat may be gone, uh, and fairly often is. So what I look for is you know, trying to lower the risk while maximizing the value of what I'm getting for the points. And one of the key ways that you can do that, and this is absolutely a hack, is paying attention to how long your points take to get into the new airline program. right? You might read about some amazing award that you can get with an airline called ANA. Uh, it's only 88,000 miles round trip from the US to Europe on any of their partners. And United is one of their partners, and they don't even charge any fuel surcharges. So if you can find available seats on United round trip to Europe, that's a really good deal, right? 88,000 points is it's 63,000 in a pretty good program just one way. So round trip for 88 sounds pretty good, right? Only one problem. 
ANA makes you book round trip. ANA also, it takes two days to get points over there from American Express. So if you have your heart set on an award and you're all ready to book it, you move over the points, two days later those seats are gone, what are you going to do? Because when you move those points, they're gone. They're not MX points anymore. They're in a Japanese airline program. They have a hard expiration date you know, in, in three years from now. Uh, there is no way to extend the value of them, and they're just locked up over there, and you can only use them for a round trip. So it's a pretty big risk that you're taking using that program, even though the deal is really good. Who likes risk? I like risk. I started two startups and lost all my money doing it. So I'm like, and, and I'm working on a third one now. So I'm fine with risk personally. Uh, you know, my worst case scenario is uh, I have to fly some out of the way route and like, you know, maybe change planes in Minsk and, uh, you know, take three stops along the way and, and sit in economy class. But I have a blog about doing that. And, you know, that's kind of an adventure to me. Uh, if you want to like do fancy champagne and lie flat business class, that may not be the risk you want to take. <laughs> you know, for me, uh, you know, if it doesn't work out, like the risk is probably okay. For, if I'm chasing a really good deal, I will always, you know, put it all on black and hope that it comes up my number. Right? <laughs> um, you know, the, for your one vacation a year, you might not want to do that. Right? So that, especially if you're married and there's somebody, there's a spouse who's like going to be really upset with you if it doesn't work out. <laughs> um, not that that has ever happened to any guy uh, whose wife got really mad at him. So anyway. Um, so it's uh, least risky when points transfers are instant. So maybe what if I told you, hey, like, you know, your points transfers into ANA, you can get this, these flights for 88,000 miles round trip. They're available now. They may not be here in two days. But we can move those points into Air Canada. Instead of being 88,000 points, it's 110,000 each. But I can get it right now. And there's no risk. Is it worth paying more to hedge the risk? And so for some people, you know, I'll just lay out their options and you know, let them make the, the decision. My recommendation is always you know, just go grab uh, what's available right now because you know, I easily half the time uh, a good award. If there's a good award, there's an almost 100% chance somebody else is going to want it and book it before you, your points get there. If it's like, uh, well, if there's a lot of seats open and, and it, it's not a popular route, like Newark to uh, Manchester, for example, on United, relatively new route, not, well, not so well known. Uh, there's no connections onward from there. So, and they make a lot of seats available because it's not selling very well. Well, if you want to take Newark to United, uh, Newark to, uh, to Manchester on United, I might say, well, you've got probably a, you know, an 80% chance of it going through just fine. Uh, so maybe, you, maybe you, you would have a different risk calculation. That's entirely up to you. So you just need to understand like this is, you know, and I hate to hammer on this so much, but I've had so many clients that really want to over-optimize for the lowest redemption rate and you know, to be able to spend the fewest number of points possible. And then when it all blows up in their face, they get really mad. So I, I would hate for you guys to, to be in that position. Um, so there are some cases where you can lower the risk even more. And that is some programs will let you call in before you transfer points anywhere and put in an award on hold. Uh, Air France lets you do this. So if you call in, Put the award on hold, get a confirmation code, you can then transfer in the points and you can then call back and buy the ticket. What does that cost you? $25 for a telephone booking fee instead of doing it online. Uh, is it worth $25 to hedge the risk of those seats not being there by the time that the points show up in your account? Probably is. On, you know, when you're, and this is something I have to like, remind people, you're going for seats that are $7,000 if you bought them with cash. So is it worth $25 to get a $7,000 ticket? Probably it's worth the $25. I think it is. But you know, of course, if you're really a cheapskate and you want to take that risk, you know, there's, there's always a, like, a, a balance of risk versus cost. And I think that $25 bucks a ticket is a, is a pretty cheap insurance. Um, so it's even less risky uh, when you can book one way and, and not round trip. And so the reason for this is that I like to go transfer in just enough points for the one way, 
make sure that the return is still there, transfer in enough points for the return, and then go get it. And so you can lower your risk by not having to book a round trip. So for example, if, if your outbound blows up on you and you've transferred points already, just go grab the return, and then we'll find another way to get you the outbound. Make sense? Cool. Uh, and so, um, and I'm going to do lots of questions at the end, Salt. So, uh, like, I left a ton of time. Uh, so, the most risky, it's kind of what we discussed, is points transfers not being instant and needing to book round trip. And the best award chart sweet spots, and this is something I really want to hammer on. So, you'll read on blogs all of these crazy deals, you know, because they want to sell you a credit card. They get a commission for you signing up for a card and getting some points. So, every blog you read, it, except for seat 31B is pretty much part of this system where really what they're doing is trying to sell you a credit card. They want to sell you the dream, baby. Like it's, it's just like full on like living the dream. And they, what they don't have is the asterisk of like how hard this stuff is actually to do in practice. That's why I have a company doing it, right? So if you read about some amazing award chart sweet spot, like with Virgin Atlantic, you can book an ANA. Uh, trip to Japan for a crazy low number of points. Only one problem, like that's actually really tough to do in practice because you have to book the award round trip and you can't put anything on hold. So, uh, you know, these are, it is possible to get it, like very occasionally I can make it happen, but you know, people coming in uh, with expectations blogs have set often are, you know, a little bit disappointed with the reality. So when you're travel hacking and you guys are, I mean, you guys are all hackers. So the thing to do is just understand what the market is, like understand the, the, uh, the attack surface, and understand what your risks are, and uh, then just go after all of the exploits you can get. So uh, I'm gonna give you a quick walkthrough of a trip I am taking in May. This is a Seattle to Colombo uh, walkthrough, uh, and I'm doing it in two of the best airline products uh, in the world, Cathay Pacific First Class, which I've flown uh, twice before, uh, and then Qatar Airlines uh, Q Suites, uh, which is like an enclosed suite in the sky, and it's considered the world's best business class uh, because the service level is mostly pretty similar to first class. So um, uh, it didn't show up, but uh, the outbound flight is uh, in Cathay first. Uh, so what do you get? Krug champagne, uh, caviar. I can't eat caviar. I'm allergic to fish, and I, and I hear it doesn't taste very good anyway. Um, but, you know, it's expensive. It's like $100 for a 10 or something, and, and that's what they serve. Um, you get a three-course meal served on a white tablecloth. Like, there's a soup course and, like, a bread basket, and they, it, it's kind of like a restaurant. You know, they come, like, wait on you. Um, they cook your breakfast to order in the sky. They've got, like, a little kitchen in the front, so they, uh, they make you bacon and eggs and, and whatever. Um, you know, there's there's Hong Kong celebrities because it's a Hong Kong airline. So usually up in the front, there'll be you know, it's a, it's usually just rich, like just rich Hong Kong guys. Like they're just it's like rich uncles. Like they're you know like property moguls or like bankers or whatever. It's just like Hong Kong rich guys are like really 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 rich, and so you can kind of tell like you know like rich Hong Kong dude is just like, and you know he'll come on with like an entourage and they leave him in first and then they go back to economy and you know that's that so it's usually just mostly that but occasionally you get celebrities too uh, and so I got that that was kind of fun last time um, the uh, lounge in Hong Kong there's like a, an exclusive first class lounge it's not very nice actually it's just the only reason it's you know exclusive is to keep the riffraff out and only first class people can be in there but I'm pretty sure Elon Musk was there so uh, you know, it's like you can hang out in a stuffy lounge with Elon Musk and, you know, and, and that's kind of just part of what the experience is. Uh, you know, they've got, they've got another lounge with complimentary foot massages. Uh, there's turndown service and a mattress pad. Uh, and they give you, you know, a nice pair of designer pajamas too because why not? Uh, anyway, um, so if you want to book the flight that I'm taking, that's the price, $10,431.32. Uh, um, and uh, would you find it online? No, because it's secret inventory. Uh, so the best flights to take often don't show up online with your points. This is a hack. So you need to know that the airline that you want to fly, who they're partners with, and then how to get those seats. Because they, they hide them. 
they don't want you in first class. Like Cathay Pacific does not want you in first class. They don't want me there. Um, they want you know Hong Kong celebrities and rich Hong Kong bankers there. So they do. They have to technically, because they're part of the One World Alliance, make these awards available. Uh, and they do. They make one seat available per flight for frequent flyer members to reserve. It's, it's a requirement as part of being part of the alliance that they're part of. But their contracts with other airlines say that they cannot display the inventory online. So unless you know that you should be able to do this, you have no way of, of actually being able to book it. You know, Alaska Airlines, uh, if you go try to book with Cathay, they're not going to show you a single Cathay flight. Uh, American Airlines won't either. So you book them over the phone the old-fashioned way. And often, for me, like, I'll call up Alaska, and they won't even know they can do this or how. So I have to walk them through how to book it on their own system. <laughs> um, and so here's proof, like, you know, I've got the confirmation code, like you can and can in fact book this through Alaska Airlines. So what I did is, so you saw the price, right? Uh, $10,431 if, if you, you know, paid with cash. And I'm sure that's what Salt would do. Like, you know, it's like, you're a billionaire, right? Um, and uh, it's like, well, if you complain about smoking, they might put you in first, no, they wouldn't. No, 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 they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Uh, but you could do 70,000 Alaska Airlines mileage pl plan miles, and I'm totally not beating up on salt. We're friends. <laughs> it's, um, the uh, the 16, so there's a $1,680 value to 70,000 Alaska Airlines mileage plan miles, the way I value them. How do I value them? What I can get for them when I spend them. I typically can get 2.4 cents per mile out of Alaska Airlines mileage plan miles when I'm spending them on you know, flights that I would otherwise pay cash for. So it's around $1,680 is like the actual value that I would otherwise get for these points. Spending them on Cathay Pacific first class, like you know, we're around seven times that. So it's pretty good. Uh, it's a pretty good return on, on uh, points. That's a pretty good hack in my view. Uh, how did I get the points? I signed up for the Bank of America Alaska Airlines credit card over and over and over and over again because uh, until a couple of months ago, they had a loophole where you could just sign up every month and, and get another uh, 40,000 point bonus. <laughs> um, you did have to pay the annual fee. So like, you know, you sign up for a card, pay the $75 annual fee, cancel it and get another one. And you could just like turn like that for like months um, and get Alaska Airlines points. So uh, didn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you could you could do like a business and a and a personal card. That's the other thing is like if you know I've got a small business. Uh, I I'm a landlord and also I have a ward cat, so I'm entitled to sign up for business card products. So every credit card you want to sign up for, you there's a business version of it. So get the business version too. You get two bonuses. So, you know, if you're pretty like this game's getting locked down on uh, locked down a bit by the banks, but there's still plenty of opportunities to go churn points and get a ton of them. Uh, Alaska's gotten pretty hard now, like the Bank of America locked that down. But it's you know airlines make most of their money through their frequent flyer programs. American Airlines literally doesn't make any money flying planes; they make all of their money from Advantage. So if you know the banks start shutting that off, like you can, you better believe that they're going to find ways to get creative in in helping you. Uh, you know, get points. So Alaska, I'm pretty sure, is going to have a way to do this. It's just always been a little bit harder to get Alaska points, and so their award chart is more generous. Uh, their points are worth more. But 70,000 points wasn't too hard for me to rack up, uh, and I dropped them on this first class flight. So if you want to spend three times as many points as needed, do the same thing with the wrong program. And so I want to walk you through that a little bit, right? So this is a totally sweet spot on the Alaska award chart. You have to know that you can book Cathay Pacific through Alaska. You have to call them up in Boise, where their call center is, and walk the agent through how to do it. And remind them that that's in a different system, because they have two airlines that are not in the normal system they use. There's one called LAN, uh, which is a Ch Chilean and Peruvian airline. So they have to do that one in a different system, and Cathay Pacific in a different system. So you'll be reminding them of some dusty you know, corner of the manual that they haven't probably looked at since they took training that this is a, an award you want to book. 
and then you have to feed them exactly the flights you want. And if they put it all in, it, it usually will work. Um, so that's the process. But if you can do that, it's 70,000 mileage plan miles uh, versus 115,000 in American Advantage, or 130,000 in Asia miles, or 270,000 in British Airways Avios. So if you know that your American Express points transfer to Avios and you just go straight to that, you're spending more than double what you need to because those points also transfer to Asia miles. Uh, and if you had Alaska Airlines points too, because you had Marriott points you could transfer to Alaska, you could do it for half the price of Asia miles, well, close to half, right? Does all this make sense? Like, you know, there's just different prices from different, uh, you know, different ways that you buy the same thing. And so it's really important to figure out how to optimize doing this. Uh, there's a tool called Award Hacker, which is awardhacker.com. And that's the t my favorite tool to figure out how much a flight should cost. Yeah. Have you done the, <coughs> have you done the conversion to points to cash and then compared to actual buying the, buying an airplane ticket with cash? So yeah, totally. So yeah, most points will trans will combine to cash at one cent per point, okay. except American Express points combine to uh, go to cash at zero point eight cents per point, huh. and you know I can typically with airline so the the reason to do that. Uh, so, and you know, with the, if you have Chase points in the Chase Sapphire Reserve, you can use those points toward travel like cash. So you can buy cash fares through Expedia using Chase points at 1.5 cents per point, right? And there's a reason to do that. Uh, there are two reasons. The first is if you want a cash fare that is cheaper than the points chart. So if I want to fly from Seattle to Oakland on Alaska Airlines, and they're, com there's, they're competing with the Southwest fare sale, that's going to be $59 for that fare. And it would be 7,500 Alaska Airlines points plus uh, Alaska Airlines mileage plan points plus $5.60 for the same flight. You know, 7,500 points at 2.4 cents per point is worth almost $200. And then on top of that, you're paying the tax. So you're paying like, you know, let's just call it $200 even versus, you know, $60, right? Is that a good deal? No, that's not a good deal. That's you're getting, you know, 25 cents on the dollar for your for the value of your airline points if you do that. So if you had Chase points, it might make more sense to go do that with 4,000 Chase points, right? At 1.5 cents per point. Uh, that would be a way better deal. So for cheap low-cost flights, it can be worth spending your points that way. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that if you go, go burn your chase points on that, you can't burn them on a transfer for a more expensive product. So what do you plan to do with your chase points in the future, and how fast are you earning them? Uh, are you, you know, I don't generally recommend that people save airline points because they're a depreciating currency. It's like saving Zimbabwe yeah. dollars. Like, you know, they, they're constantly devaluing these charts, uh, and they devalue at a very rapid pace. So you don't want to, like, Every time I hear people saying, I'm saving up for a trip, it's like, you're crazy. Like, you should spend your points as quickly as you can for, for a trip that you have enough points for right now. If you want to take a specific trip and you don't have enough points, let's talk about some ways to get those points right now so you can burn them before they devalue again. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the, uh, the best way to approach this. You don't want to have big points balances. You want to have, like, big trips booked balances. Yeah, uh, maybe a follow-up. How long would you kind of recommend accumulating the points before they start to devalue too much, like half a year or something like that? Or? You know, airlines can and do devalue at any time, sometimes with no notice at all. Avianca Colombian Airlines gave no notice at all. Boom, their points were devalued. They, ha they are shutting down for system maintenance for five days uh, starting on February 1st. What do you think is going to happen when they reopen the system after that? My guess is your Avianca life miles aren't going to be worth as much. If you have any, go burn them right now. If you want anything on the Avianca chart, do it today, uh, you know, before they shut down the system. Because, you know, those guys are bad actors. They just, any time uh, that they want to devalue the chart, they just do it. They don't give any notice at all. Uh, most airlines give you some notice. Japan Airlines gave nine months of notice before they devalued. Um, you know, because doing what Avianca does doesn't fly in Japan. Uh, Korean, you know, they haven't had a devaluation. I can't remember the last one, but it's really hard to get Korean points. So, you know, that's the 
you know, not, not every program operates the same. Not every program, uh, you know, has, like not every, not the value of points in every program is not consistent. And the behavior of a program in devaluation is not consistent either, is the short answer. Well, I guess it's a long answer. So uh, the return flight, Qatar, uh, you know, J means uh, business class. So I'm, I'm flying in uh, Qatar's business class product. They don't have a first class. What they basically did is they made their business class a first class, and they sell it for business class prices. So that's kind of the deal with this airline. They're just they're trying to be the world's best business class. That's their thing. Uh, so I was able to get that too. Um, they do first class levels of service except for caviar. They do not have caviar. I, I'm sorry. Um, it's yeah. If you if you want salty fish eggs, it's like have you had caviar before? Is it any good? It's really good. Oh okay. I I can't eat it so. There's a, there's a seaweed version that IKEA makes. Yeah. Yeah. So you can try. Um, caviar made out of it. Does, does seaweed caviar taste like real caviar? No. <laughs> no? Okay. It's like, yeah, exactly. So, um, but no, like, the, it's like, you know, they, they bring, like, it's like Volga, Volga River sturgeon caviar or something. It's like, you know, they're, it's the real deal. Like, you know, people that can eat it say it's good. It's just, yeah. Uh, but you won't be getting that on Qatar. Um, they do have sushi in their lounge, though, made fresh. So that's, if that's a consolation. I can't eat that either. Uh, <laughs> They do a four-course meal because there is an amuse-bouche, uh, unlike Cathay, which cut their amuse-bouche. So, uh, oh, is it amuse-bouche? Okay, no yes. There. Oh, there's no accent on there. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know how to say it, so like all I, I'll, all I do is read it. It's like, yeah. See, see. So you're like you're you're kind of the billionaire class already. It's like you know how to say this. Oh, you speak French. Okay. Oh, 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 a mule's bush. Oh, okay. When you go on these trips, are you able to blend in? Like, no, okay. no, absolutely not. Like, I, I rock up, like, dress like a hacker, and, like, what immediately happens is I walk into a place that's, like, clearly not for me, like, like the, the wing first class lounge in Hong Kong, and out of nowhere, like, corners, like, shoom, uh, swoop a whole bunch of people who are like, your ticket, please. And I hand it to them, and they look at it, and they're like, oh. <laughs> um, and, you know, basically, it's like, oh, tech CEO. Uh, you know, like, the, the, I think they figured out that, you know, like, West Coast tech people just, you know, don't quite look like they expect. But at the same time, they really don't want me in the place with the rich, rich stuffy Hong Kong banker who's in a three-piece suit. Like, it's not... You know, they have to let me in because I have a ticket, but, but, the, but they are not really happy. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, the Q suites, like it's a fully enclosed suite with a door that closes. There's no door that closes on Cafe Pacific first, so this is going to be pretty fun. Um, they give you a mattress pad and turn down service, and that's very unusual for business class. And I'll get another set of pajamas. So, like, one trip, I get two sets of pajamas. Um, I don't know if they're designer Hong Kong PYE pajamas like, uh, you know, like Cathay Pacific. I'll have to, you know, test those out. So what's this actual flight worth? $3,800. It's normally much more, but if you leave from Colombo, it's a cheap market to leave from. So if I bought the ticket, it'd be around $3,800 for this. Uh, and so what I paid was 63,000 American Airlines Advantage points. And so that yields a six cent per mile value roughly. Uh, and that's you know the actual cash fare for for this flight. Um, would I pay that? No, I I don't know about you. I can't drop four grand on a flight like that's. <laughs> yeah, my mortgage could be paid for quite a while for that. So uh, you know my usual value though for Amer for advantage points is around one point eight cents per mile. So if I'm spending them on flights that I would otherwise pay cash for, uh, that's what I'm getting. So you know I'm getting more than triple the value I normally do for these points. And there was a hack, so. There were two hacks, actually. The first is, to get these flights, the cheapest way to get them is on the American Airlines Advantage chart. And until very recently, they didn't list Qatar Airlines flights on their website because they didn't want you to book them, uh, you know, because it's more expensive for them to get you these tickets. They have to pay. The airlines actually pay each other cash behind the scenes when you spend points. And Qatar charges a lot for their award seats, so, you know, American tried to hide the inventory. They recently finally have opened it up, and I think the reason they have is that Qatar is leaving One World, 
So they're giving people a chance to, to go do it before Qatar's out of it. Uh, and you know, the other thing that I did is I had a credit card with, a, with a, you know, an American affiliated bank called Barclay. Uh, and that gives that particular card product gives you a 10% discount on your redemptions. Uh, it's actually a rebate, but effectively it's a discount. So the price on the chart is 73,000, but I really only paid 63,000 for it. Um, but you know, I promised uh, making benefit of uh, Belarus Museum of Cat. And uh, so what about cats? Uh, this is the Museum of Cats in, uh, in Minsk. Uh, it's not really a museum. It's more like a just a very elaborate cat, cat cafe in a like, you know, Belarus uh, has these just lovely spaces that are, uh, you know, really comfortable and cozy and well decorated and lots of, you know, old books and that kind of thing. It's uh, they just they're really into the, the whole cafe kind of look. And, uh, you know, so the cat museum looks like this. There's cats there and and fine art. I mean, why not a combination, right? Uh, so um, let's go to Minsk. It's the uh, last dictatorship in Europe and Belarus. Uh, cats are in charge, although their president Alexander Lukashenko claims to be. Clearly, like any country with a museum of cat, uh, and most countries don't have this, you know, the cats are really in charge, right? Uh, the visa process, as you might expect in a dictatorship, is relatively complicated for Americans uh, because our countries don't have a friendly relationship. Uh, so I was really excited that they uh, changed the policy where you can transit through Minsk for five days. And that doesn't require a visa. So it, instead of having to do this you know, very complicated document and uh, spending you know, several weeks and a lot of money, it was $200, I think, to get a visa. Yeah? Now it's 30 days, I believe, as of maybe last year. Oh, for transit? Oh wow! I'll have to go back. I really, really like Minsk. It's like uh, Belarus is one of my was one of my favorite countries to visit. Oh yeah. And if they. They built a they built a Russian border though. Like the Russians put put in checkpoints. Yeah, yeah. as soon as uh, Lukashenko started doing the five-day transit, uh, Russia built a checkpoint. Like Belarus doesn't have any checkpoints for the Russians, but uh, Russia has uh, border checks going the other way. So uh, maybe they will build uh, an iron curtain, who knows. Um, although uh, I hear also that uh, President Putin has decided that uh, the relationship will be tighter between Belarus and Russia, even maybe a merger. And I'm not sure that... <laughs> Uh, I don't think so, um, but was it last time? <laughs> so anyway, uh, the so there's a so there's a five or thirty day transit. So you know, just to give you an idea, like when you're going to these, you know, when you're going to countries that the U.S. doesn't get along with, uh, they don't make it easy for you to visit. It, you know, getting a Russian visa is very complicated and expensive. It was the same for a visa from Belarus. So like when there's a, a door that cracks open. Sometimes it's only for a short time. And so I wanted to go really fast in case it closed again. Uh, so the way that the rules of this, and this is totally a hack, was to be able to get in for five days, you had to fly to a third location via the Minsk airport. Minsk is not exactly a major transit point of anything. Uh, it's, it's a small airport. It's a nice airport, but it's small. Uh, there are, you know, there's a limited amount of service there. Um, and so being able to find a flight that goes through Minsk on the way to somewhere else requires that you fly Bolivia Belarus Airlines because that's the only airline that really has a, uh, a hub inside of Minsk. Uh, and then once you're there, well, it's not so cheap. It's, uh, I guess it's cheaper than here. But uh, I'm, you know, my point of reference is places like Southeast Asia, Poland, uh, Bulgaria, Ukraine. Uh, Bulgaria is much cheaper than Belarus. It's like, you know, actually things there are priced uh, more like Russia uh, because their economy is, is closely tied to Russia. And Russia is not a very cheap country to visit. Um, so how did I do this? Well, uh, what I built, what I did was the first thing was get to Europe. 
And so this is one of my favorite hacks if you want to visit a specific destination in a given region. Instead of looking for a ticket straight through to that destination, instead what you do is you look for someplace on the continent or in the region. And so what I was able to do uh, was find a ticket to Barcelona on American Airlines, which was an Alaska partner. And I booked on the last day of the off-peak period. So uh, there was a, it's normally 30,000 miles, but it's 20,000, it was at the time 20,000 miles. It's gone up to 22,500 in the off-peak period. And the off-peak period was actually all the way through May 1st. So I booked uh, on May, I, I booked on April 30th, which was the last day of the off-peak period to go to Barcelona. So I was able to then get it for only 20,000 miles. Not a cheap ticket, right? Like, you know, flying to Barcelona like in, in the late spring, like, well, mid-spring is not, uh, not a cheap ticket normally. So I got pretty good value for that, and it was an economy class. Uh, then what I did is I used, we talked a little bit about how you can spend Chase Ultimate rewards like cash. It was $280 for a ticket from Barcelona through Minsk to Kyiv uh, in Ukraine. And I wanted to go to Kyiv. So what I did is I used my Chase Ultimate rewards points at 1.5 cents per point for the Bolivia flight because there was no way to get Bolivia flights. There's, they're not a partner with any other airline. So if you want to fly Bolivia, uh, you have to pay them cash or you have to use points that spend like cash. And that's what I use my Chase points for. Why? Because I was broke. I didn't have money, so I had lots of points and, and not a lot of money. So I just used it for that. Uh, and then to come back, uh, I had some points in Avianca Life Miles that I got from signing up for their Avianca Buela card uh, through a Puerto Rican bank. And uh, so, I went and burned them on a return flight on Lufthansa in business class, which was pretty nice. Uh, and that was just uh, key Frankfurt, Frankfurt direct through to Seattle. Uh, and so there were no fuel surcharges with any of this. So some of these tickets, you know, you, if you fly with British Airways, even if you spend your miles, you still have to spend cash too. Uh, they have a, like a copay, and it can be around $1,100 for a round trip. So you're paying a premium economy price and us effectively getting an upgrade to business class if you fly with them. I like to pay a zero price other than, it. You, there's no way except uh, to get out of paying the actual tax. But there is there are points you can use that get you out of these fuel surcharges. So when you fly on American using Alaska points, there's no fuel surcharge. When you fly on any airline using Lufthansa, there's no fuel surcharge. All you pay is the booking fee, which was $25 on Lufthansa, $12.50 on Alaska. And you pay the actual tax, uh, which is on the outbound $5.60. And on the return, you get hit with all the US immigration taxes. So it comes out to around $100 coming in from Europe. Uh, so that's basically how that worked. Um, and now this is the part where you guys can ask any questions you want. And if there's someone who wants to book a trip right now, we will do it live. Like, I'll just give you the same service that I would if you were um, going to, you know, like buy the service. And it's normally $149 per person, uh, but we'll do it right here using your points and your example for free. Hey, what's up, Salt? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that and we'll get to your next one. Um, that's a very good point. So within the US, we've moved to a model where pretty much everything is priced based on a one-way trip. Uh, and it, doesn't, it just costs half the round trip price to go one way. Um, and what I often will do is check one direction at a time for US itineraries because you know a lot of the time it's cheaper to go out with Delta and maybe come back with Alaska if you're leaving from Seattle, as an example. Uh, so internationally, they haven't figured, the, figured out how to do this yet. So it's still stuck in the 1980s pricing model where a one-way ticket costs three times as much as a round trip sometimes. So 
if you're going one way to London and it's five hundred eighty dollars one uh, round trip and it's you know two thousand five hundred eighty dollars one way, yeah, like it's pretty smart to book a round trip, pick a throwaway date, the cheapest one for the return, and then just not show up, and that's totally fine. And you can do that uh, by you're not that is never a thing with points, right? If you're using airline points. They don't do that. It's just priced each direction usually, or you're required to book a round trip in the program. So uh, I'll give you another example. If you're using Alaska Airlines mileage plan miles to book a trip on Korean, you can go one way, but they charge you the round trip price. So uh, it's because all tickets are priced as a round trip. That's just the, the agreement they have with Korean to be able to use your points there. Uh, if you're using points that spend like cash, so if you were going to London in the economy class for $580, that would be less than 40,000 points uh, for um, if you use Chase Ultimate Rewards that spend like cash with the Chase Sapphire Reserve. And that may be a better deal than an anytime award with their partner United. But Chase points also transfer to United. And the United award chart at Saber level for one way in economy class is 30,000 points. So if you just use the portal and you look for, you know, even if you're going to use your hack and do a round trip, that could end up costing more than a one way through the airline program. And so that's where a points transfer can save you points. Makes sense? Cool. And you had another and, and, question? Uh, well, and I guess follow up to that before I get to others, but um, uh, is there ever a point at which you would get in trouble for not showing up? So that depends on the airline. There's no legal trouble you'll get in. Okay. Uh, some airlines, so there's these itineraries called Hidden Cities Itineraries. There's a site called Skiplagged, S-K-I-P-L-A-G-G-E-D. And what they'll do is they'll check some of this stuff, like is a round trip cheaper than a one way? And also like, oh, you're going to Washington DC. Is it cheaper to buy a ticket to Boston that changes planes in Washington DC and just get off there? Right. Uh, and that's like a common way people get to Dulles from here, for example. So I generally don't recommend doing that. The, the round trip throwaway leg, yeah, don't worry about that. That's totally fine. The, I, I do that pretty much whenever. The one way hidden city, I don't recommend doing usually. And the reason why is that well, you know, if the crew doesn't show up or there's weather or whatever, they, they might just reroute you. So what could happen if you, in the aforementioned example, is you were flying from Seattle to DC, that's where you want to end up. I don't know why I hate DC, but you know, suppose you want to get to DC and you've got a Seattle, Dulles, Boston flight, right? And you show up at the airport and they say, yeah, you know, the captain's got the flu, so we've, uh, but you know, good news, I've got a better itinerary for you. It gets you to Boston faster. Seattle, Denver, Boston. And you're like, oh, um, uh-oh, because now you're going to Boston, and that's pretty far from DC, and you bought a ticket to Boston, that's all, you, all, all that United owes you. So, and if you tell them, yeah, I'd actually really rather fly through DC, they're, they're totally going to know what you were doing. So the money that you saved by doing that, like it only has to blow up in your face once to end up costing you way more. So. I just don't recommend it. Like I, I don't think it's a good practice most of the time. Uh, yeah, you also can't check bags. You can take carry on. Um, yeah, if you check a bag, it's going to show. It's go, it's going to Boston even if you get off and you're you see. You're also usually booked really like low class on there, and you're at the risk of not being able to put your bag book and then you know, Yeah, yeah, that's that's also true. So yeah, if you bought a cheap ticket, like, uh, and they're like, yeah, well. <laughs> Hey, buddy, like uh, you're in basic economy. That means uh, there's no overhead bin space. We'll just check your bag right here through to your final destination, right? Uh, it's, it's like, well, I really can't give up my bag. It's full of drugs and guns. Like, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, you're, you're basically screwed at that point. So there's, there's a lot of reasons not to do it. You know, I've still done it ever anyway, like a couple of times, uh, because I had a backup plan for the risk. I booked to Boston. What I had on hold was a Boston to DC flight, like a Boston to Baltimore flight on Southwest that I could take in a pinch and I had the ability to spend points on it. So I always just make sure I have a backup plan in case I end up in the city I didn't want to be in. And 
as long as you, you have that and it still pencils out anyway, then sure, fine, it's okay. Like the worst you'll lose is a few hours, but and you know you should on a coast to coast flight the whole day is blown anyway, right? You should never plan anything. If you're flying to the east coast, don't plan anything same day. So red eye. Yeah, red eye. <laughs> I don't know about you, but like I'm just trashed if I'm starting at like three in the morning, west coast time, like trying to do something in uh, uh, on the east coast uh, after like sleeping next to a trying to sleep next to a crying baby on a transcontinental flight. Like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Because I, I blew through a lot of material really fast. Like, did, did this make sense to you guys? Like, is. Yeah, but I have a question. Yeah. Also. So, I'm old enough to remember scheduling long layovers. So, I legitimately wanted to know if you guys remember scheduling long layovers. So, I legitimately wanted to go to Boston and then to DC or whatever. But I wanted to spend a day in Boston and then get on the next flight to DC. And I used to be able to do that, but now. Now it's two tickets if the layover is more than four hours. If you, yeah, if you're online, like, yeah, you can't go five hours. So is You can with a frequent flyer ticket. So that's what I'm asking you is how do I book that long layover? You do it in a, as a multi-city itinerary, and there are only certain programs you can do it in. So American Airlines relaxed the rules a few months ago because people were complaining they couldn't get anywhere with advantage points. So instead of like actually fixing the problem, they're like, well, we'll extend out to 23 hours and 59 minutes the amount of a layover. And we'll extend out to the, nu the number of stops to like default to searching up to two stops. So now if you want to go to, you know, from here to New York, they might offer you an itinerary from here to Dallas, uh, an overnight in Dallas, and then Dallas to Oklahoma City, and then Oklahoma City to like LaGuardia or something. And, um, and you know, the thing takes two full days to do, right? So you can do that with points, uh, and it'll price out. How I would look is I'd do a multi-city itinerary, and I'd go from here to here, and then there to there, and be sure it's at least 23 hours and 59 minutes or less. And you can sometimes do it. Is it worth blowing 12,500 advantage points on that? So usually it's more expensive. Um, well, you know, like there, twelve thousand five hundred advantage points has value, uh, and at you know one point eight cents per, like you can calculate what that's worth. And I would say that if you know the cash fare is going to be more than the one point eight cents per mile, you've got a pretty good hack there. One of my favorite tricks with layovers, uh, with stopovers actually. So, did you know you can take a stopover on a one-way trip if uh, if you use Alaska Airlines mileage plan miles? What does that mean? Well, uh, I run a black badge contest at DEF CON called the Tele-Challenge. It's like a phone CTF. And so I go to M Minneapolis in the winter, actually close to the winter, like the very late fall, to plan this with the, P the Minnesotans that I do this with. They make me go there when it's cold. <laughs> and it's not cheap to fly to Minneapolis because that's a Delta hub. So if you want to go Seattle, Minneapolis, it's like crazy expensive. It's, you know, $300 or something. So I like to use miles to do it. And what I did is I used points to get there. I, actually, I had some expiring money uh, with Alaska Airlines. It was, gonna, it was like you know, a credit that they gave me for getting bumped off a flight. So I spent that to get there. And then to come back, I was going to use points. But they only had available uh, first class, which is 25,000 miles. And that's a lot of miles to spend on a flight from Minneapolis to Seattle, even if it's in Alaska first, right? So I got to thinking, hmm, if I'm going to spend that many miles, what do I actually like want to do later in the year from Seattle? Like, is there a trip in first class I'd want to take? Like maybe to Sri Lanka on Cathay Pacific, for example. So that itinerary I showed you didn't start in Seattle. It started several months ago in Minneapolis. I'm on a stopover right now. It's a very long <laughs> stopover. It's like a seven month stopover here in Seattle. And I'm continuing my journey onward in, uh, in May to Sri Lanka. Uh, so that's, that's another Book fun way to use uh, stopovers. Booked as a multi-leg. Yeah, well, so like I needed the flight from Minneapolis anyway. I just started the journey there and like used the, the, stop, the one way, stopover on a one way that Alaska lets you do to be able to do that. What most people do with a, with a stopover involving Cathay Pacific is they'll stop for a few days in Hong Kong because that's 
a logical place to break your journey, you can also do that. I just chose to have a long stop over in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Saul? So a lot of this has to do with basically trying to get above your baseline rate, right? Your rate is like 1.8 uh, cents per mile. Well, so it actually, people value miles differently, right, and that's, well, a, that's sure, a key, but, right? But the key is to try to beat out the valuation a good hack is that, yeah. Okay. And especially if you get outsized value, like way better than that. So what if you're like, you know, hyper flexible? You can often find like four thousand dollar flights for three eighty, four hundred dollars. Just catch, it, it, look at the right time, get one of those eighty percent off deals. You know, yeah, yeah. So they come up like, is is it worth? I mean, I guess this is. If you're less flexible. Well, no, it's it's actually no. You need to be really flexible to do it. The thing is, like, what what I'm doing, what I use points for, is two things. Uh, I use points for flights that would be completely unachievable, you know, given where I am in my own personal economic situation. Unlike some of the billionaires here, I cannot drop twenty five grand on a first class flight without without batting an eye, right? Like, you know, it's I'm just not in that income stratosphere. Um, you know, I, I get that. Uh, you know, if you're working for Jewel and you got a million dollar bonus this year, like you know, it's it's a little different. But um, so for me to have those experiences, the only way I can get them is points. And you know, so that's that's kind of like one way to optimize this. Another way to optimize it is, uh, well, what if you need to take a flight that would be really expensive? Uh, you know, like I had a last minute trip that I had to take um, and, you know, it, unfortunately it was, it was for a funeral and that would have cost me because it's, it was last minute and because it was to a small town, you know, like a secondary airport in the middle of the country. If you go look at what it costs to go to some place like Tulsa last minute, it's really expensive. It's like $800 each way. So. Uh, you know, using miles can be a great way to get those kinds of tickets that would, would otherwise cost a lot. Uh, I, I also like to go really unusual places. Like, I have been to Adak, Alaska. Anybody know where that is? I went with Seastone. Uh, we went and ex explored an abandoned former nuclear Navy sub base. Uh, that's what's out there. Um, it's pretty fun. And, you know, if you bought a ticket to there, it literally costs less to go to Turkmenistan. I'm not even kidding. It's like, you know, it was it's one thousand seven hundred and seventeen dollars round trip from Seattle, and using points was a great way to do it. So, you know, that's how, that's kind of the best way to to think about using points. It's like when you can be kind of flexible, or pretty flexible with when, what you're doing, and you want to have a really just kind of knock it out of the sky experience, or if you want to do a, uh, you know, like a trip that's kind of last minute and it would would just otherwise be really expensive to do. Um, so if you have the time, yeah, it can be worth paying. So I'll, I'll give you a great example. Like you've been, you might subscribe to Scott's cheap flights or follow the flight deal on Twitter or something like that. And so there are these really cheap pairs that come up sometimes. I'm paying five hundred. I paid five hundred and sixty dollars round trip uh, from Vancouver to Sydney, Australia. Uh, and for next September. That's a really good fare. But because it's on Qantas, I will earn Alaska Airlines mileage plan points for that. And I don't know if you've checked, it's a long way to Australia. So, and the, you know, Alaska Airlines mileage plan gives you one point for every mile that you actually fly. So the value of the Alaska Mi Airlines mileage plan miles that I got subtracted from that fare means that I'm effectively really only paying $180 and something to go to Australia. Uh, but I'm not actually stopping in Sydney. I'm using 20,000 American Airlines miles to take me round trip from there to Perth. And then I'm using another 45,000 Delta Sky miles to take me to Christmas Island, which is the top level domain .cx. So yes, I am visiting the original home of Goatsy. <laughs> wow. To see the crabs. There's these famous crabs there. Like, anyway. <laughs> How do you, um, so when you generate the points, is the majority of them like the initial synapse or just are there other techniques you're using? Yeah, there are other techniques you can use. Uh, 
does anybody want their spending and financial uh, life to look like somebody who launders a lot of money? <laughs> um, so there's a technique called manufactured spending where people do things like go buy a bunch of Green Dot gift cards and then cash them in for Walmart money orders and then use those to like you know deposit into obscure credit union accounts, but in amounts less than ten thousand dollars, so the forms don't get filled out. Um, you know, it's it, you might also be con, uh, committing a crime called structuring, which sent uh, you know Ben the fence to federal prison, but that's a different story. Um, yeah. Yeah, my friends used to send uh, their rents to each other via credit card on Square. Yeah. That's, that's how they kind of yeah, totally. And so, you know, there's there's like what I do is I do like kind of the like there's black hat manufactured spending and there's white hat manufactured spending, I guess is a good way to put it. So, you know, for example, uh, I have, you know, even though I own a house up here, I'm working out of Olympia right now. And so I'm running an apartment down there for the pro you know duration of the project. So I pay rent and they have uh, this thing set up with uh, a company called Rent Cafe. So for a 2.5% fee, you can pay your rent with a credit card. Well, I need to spend, I've got this new Chase Inc, pre, uh, Chase Inc uh, is it the preferred? Yeah, it's the business preferred. Um, and I get an 80,000 point bonus, which is worth around $1,200. So uh, it's worth 2.5% of the $750 a month I spend on rent to be able to you know, get that spending on this card to hit the bonus. Because uh, I have to spend $5,000 in, in three months to be able to get that 80,000 point bonus. And I just don't spend that much money because you know, I'm, I'm not spending any money taking flights. And what else is there to spend money on, right? Um, so you know, the, the rent will get me, I don't know, $2,150 or something toward that limit. And then I'm just putting all of my other spending uh, on that card. And that'll just get me barely over. Uh, the 5,000 without having to do anything sketchy. You can do all sorts of sketchy stuff. There are groups uh, of people that are involved in this manufactured spending. Uh, occasionally, they get approached by the FBI. And that's just, you know, I'm a hacker, and I don't really want to be that. Like, I'm, I live a pretty high-profile high life, but I don't want to be that high-profile. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm just curious. What do you do about, like, any anonymous activity? Do you make fake names? What do you mean? Like with any of these. Oh, the manufacturing spending stuff? No, I mean like in your own life. Oh, like no, mileage like, programs? No. Like, you a, like the, 20 credit cards all with your exact yeah. name. No, no, no. Like, so flying is not a, like travel is not an anonymous activity. In fact, if you try to do it anonymous. But programs could be technically, right? No. no. Yeah. Well, OK, so yes, you could. Yes, in you could, in right? theory, you could set up fake mileage accounts like right. under John Doe mm -hmm. with like a bogus date of birth. And then you could, you could, person. and you could like go, yeah. go, or you know, here's what you could do. Why not steal somebody's identity? Sign up for a whole bunch of credit cards in their name. Like do a mileage account. Like uh, you know, just basically steal all the money and then like burn the tickets uh, and burn the redemptions for tickets to Nigeria, which Nigerians will pay you actual cash for. Because um, oh wait, like there's a really big problem with that. So there's just massive fraud, and you know the airlines are pay a lot of attention to racking up a large number of points quickly and then burning them for tickets to like you know strange destinations. Also, what if you pick the name of a terrorist? Like what if you like what you know what if you like pick some name like you made up some name that's on a watch list or maybe what if it ended up on a watch list because that name doesn't have any profile at all and like they know to look for that too. You're going to show up at the airport, and people are going to want to ask you questions wearing suits and sunglasses. It's not good. Don't do that. Don't do shady shit when you travel, especially internationally. You don't want to go to jail in Belarus, right? <laughs> it's like they still have the KGB there. I'm not even kidding. Actually, so you talked a little bit about like the hidden city thing. Like, what happens if you miss like the first like the experience? They cancel everything all the way through. Like, yeah, um, or you know, you're basically at the mercy of the airline. You have to call them and say, "Hey, I missed the first." So, hey, you might be saying, "Hey, if I fly from Vancouver to Seattle to LA to Sydney, for example, could I just not get on the plane in Vancouver and like have to cross the border? Could I just get on the plane in Seattle because I'm already here?" And the answer is no, because uh, the airline totally knows what you were up to. And they price that fare from Seattle a lot higher uh, because it doesn't involve a connection and, and crossing a border and all of that. Uh, so 
you know, why, is, uh, why was that fare so cheap? From leaving from Canada, routing through the US, Canadians hate doing that because our border guards are complete assholes to them. So, you know, basically anything that's routing through the United States, like Qantas' sales are way down from Canada. So they have to, you know, practically give the fares away to be able to attract that traffic. <laughs> What's that? Uh, yeah, that's also true. Like these are priced in Canadian dollars, and so if the Canadian dollar is relatively lower. The Canadian dollar was super low when I bought that ticket during college to Japan. It was $299 Canadian, that was 200 US. Yeah, on that note, have you, so I'm, I'm currently planning a trip that partway through, I, partway through on two different spaces, I'd have to book my next, because I would be at like about a month and a half out from the end point. Okay. So have you purchased tickets inside countries? Yeah, like inside, I've bought tickets inside countries. Uh, Europe actually, like if you think of the whole EU Schengen area as a country, very common. Yeah, I've done that play in Europe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I usually recommend if you're going to if you're going to like end destination in Europe, don't focus on that. Like, yeah, sure, you want to go to Venice. There aren't a whole lot of flights, international flights to Venice. There are lots of you know intra European flights on low cost carriers that don't participate in frequent flyer programs. Um, you know, like most the the most flights into Venice are on EasyJet, and they don't have frequent flyer programs with anybody. And yeah, and they're really cheap. It's like you know, from practically anywhere in Europe, you can get to Italy for fifty bucks on EasyJet. Um, is there a list of these uh, spaces or uh, like new destinations that uh, open up? Because I know I've gone a couple of these flights where it's like, wait, I can fly from Seattle to Sicily for three hundred dollars. Oh, so new routes, that's a really good yeah. point, Salt. So one travel hack that's pretty awesome is, you know, when you get into trying to spend your points, like it's so hard to find availability. You need to be exceedingly flexible. And so, um, you know, and that's why I have a company doing it. It's like, that's why there's travel hacking as a service. This stuff is, is super tough. So what are some of the ways that we find seats? One of my favorite ways actually is looking for new routes. Uh, last year, American Airlines started flying to Budapest and to um, Prague from Philadelphia. Those were brand new routes that they opened up. And when they open up a brand new route, then until people really know that's there, there, you know, there can be availability that's otherwise pretty hard to find. So if I had clients going to Europe, it's like, cool, we're gonna book you to Budapest uh, if you're heading anywhere in like, you know, continental Europe. And we'll find you a cheap flight on Wizz Air because Wizz Air is a low-cost carrier that's based in Budapest, and, and that'll get you the rest of the way. And you know, it's it's basically an easy connection. Uh, or why not just visit Budapest? Well, don't go to Croatia. I don't like Hungary; they're not very friendly. But uh, Croatia's right next door, and it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, if travel's like such a priority, why not just work for an airline? Uh, you know, I'm, I, right now I work for the state of Washington for five figures as a senior security architect, and I make more money than I would working for an airline. Yeah, so it's just overall, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, the thing is when you're working full time, like, you know, in a very fast moving business like an airline, even though you have travel benefits, there's no time to use them. That's so. That's not hypothetically true. Uh, Alaska's IT office uses that. They pay pretty well, but they have also their contractors. Yeah, I mean, most of their most people at Alaska are, are uh, contractors. They've had a hiring freeze for a while, because uh, and they're hiring three thousand people now. But it's it's almost all front frontline staff. You work there? No, uh, I'm entertaining right now. Oh, awesome. I, I'm trying to set it up. Uh, yeah, I mean, Alaska is a great company. They're they're highly disciplined in how they operate. They're like very military. Yeah, uh, but. That sounds like it's like, you know, it's like they're, they watch your hours and that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, they're, it, they run a pretty tight ship and they're pretty competent. Salt, it does offer travel benefits and internships. So there's a benefit to the internship that's also travel benefits. Yeah, I mean, I gave a talk at Hope um, a couple of years ago and people are like, well, should you try to make friends with airline employees, like to be able to use their travel benefits? And I'm like, well, you know, they're interesting people. Like, <laughs> people at airlines are, are you know, can be great friends. Like they've they've got interesting things to talk about. They've been different places, but 
How good of a friend would you be if you're only a friend to try to mooch off of somebody's benefits? Do you like it when people ask you to fix their computer and they barely know you? I mean, it's it's the same kind of thing. So. Also, be extremely flexible because they're usually flying standby. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, like so, airline standby. Like what that means is you don't actually have a seat. You show up at the airport and you've got a position on a list, and in the pecking order, it's based on seniority. So you're going to be all the way down at the bottom if you just started a new airline job. So to go anywhere nice, like, um, eh, you can still do it if you're flexible and you're doing it on a Wednesday uh, on the red eye. But you need to like always have a backup plan when you're doing that because there are no guarantees. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that uh, points kind of exhibit inflation, like they they're to get the value. Rapid and, inflation. Yeah. Yeah, and then also. Um, Points that are hard to get don't really have as much inflation. Any other properties like what you see, economic properties you've seen in points? The, the economic properties of points, yes, there is one other dimension, and that is that airlines, um, so here's a great example. Uh, Virgin, Australia, and Qantas both didn't, if you were redeeming their, so they have crappy points programs anyway. Uh, their points are worth less than other airlines to, to be able to get their own flights. Uh, if you're spending Alaska points on Qantas flights, that's a way cheaper way to get a Qantas flight than with Qantas points, right? So their points are, their programs are already pretty crappy. And then what they started doing just this year, like at the beginning of 2019, is they make you pay a fuel surcharge on top of, so you redeem your points at a shitty rate and you pay all the taxes. And then they also just add on this co-payment. Why? Because fuck you, that's why. Like, <laughs> you have no leverage. Like, your only leverage is having transferable points that if you don't like what one airline does, be able to use a different airline's program. And so that's why I always try to encourage people to accumulate, you know, if you're gonna try to accumulate a lot of points, do it with Amex points. But even then, like, don't only do Amex. Also do Chase, also try to do City, maybe also do Capital One, because the, the program partners change all the time. One of the best ways last year to spend Chase Ultimate Rewards points was to transfer them to Korean Air, uh, and use the and use Korean Air for uh, points for flights on Delta, Alaska, and Korean Air themselves. Right. That all went away when Korean Air like decided they weren't getting enough out of their partnership with Chase, and they just unilaterally canceled it. Uh, so, you know, partners can drop off, and one of the best ways to use points can go away. Uh, so if you you know even if you're accumulating points in in Chase with the assumption of being able to use them for an award with one of their partners, that may not be possible. Uh, Air France they used to have really consistent availability. Uh, it was pretty predictable and they had a, a, a pretty decent award chart and like that the prices were very consistent. They went to this completely variable thing now. It's almost impossible to find flights on their partners. Uh, Delta pulled virtually all of their availability. Uh, and you know, so you can use it for flights on Air France and KLM, uh, which is great if you are going to Europe from the U.S. and you want to pay their crazy surcharges because they do add on like a couple of hundred dollars in fuel surcharges each direction, right? Uh, and also, if you want to pay crazy higher prices than before, because they tripled the price in some cases. Uh, so yeah, like what can happen with the evaluation? Totally unpredictable. It's like, it's like you know, uh, well, no, it's oh, like. Funny. Uh, it's like the economy of Suriname, like, you know, the president of Suriname, uh, who is not president for life, but, you know, highly influences their central, central bank bond Surinams. Um, you know, basically they decide overnight that they need to pay government employees because they haven't paid them in the last six months and they don't have any money, so they're just going to print it. Now your Suriname dollars are worth half as much. Uh, you know, the airline decides that they want to make more money for Wall Street next quarter, like, screw you and your points. And the only thing preventing them from driving the value all the way to zero is that this is where airlines make all their money. So they can't kill the golden goose. Like they have to just move the goalposts a little bit so you keep, you know, chasing the unachievable award, right? Yeah. Sounds like there's also kind of the 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 really expensive flights they have they have an agreement that it has to be available to four points. Well, okay, so that's part of the alliances. So United in the US, the major airlines are United, who is a member of Star Alliance, Delta, who is a founding member of the Sky Team, uh, American Airlines, who's a member of One World, 
Alaska is not a member of any of these alliances. Uh, they have um, bilateral agreements with every airline they have partnerships with, but you know, and how that. But most of their the airlines that they're partners with are One World, and it seems like, you know, the way that they've set them up, often very closely resembles the deal American has. So, it seems almost as though Alaska is kind of negotiating the same deal that American had with the partner, just a separate contract. Uh, so. American couldn't search Cathay Pacific online. Alaska can't either. The award pr prices used to be exactly the same, but American devalued at a faster rate. So you know, it's basically um, when you look at those members of alliances, American Airlines has to have the ability to book on Qatar because they're both members for now of One World. That's going to go away. Qatar's leaving, but. Uh, if you have American points, Qatar has to let you redeem them on their airline. Uh, there are some differences, though. So, uh, you know, these alliances are weakening. One World's still relatively strong, and you still have the ability to book almost anything with One World using any One World airlines part, uh, airline partner's points. Sky Team, um, they have a, a they have the. A, they have a provision in the agreement where they can make more seats available to their own members than those of other programs. And so what they end up doing is like Delta pulled pretty much all their availability from Air France and KLM and, and vice versa. So there's you know just a handful of seats that you can get on each airline. And the reason that they're able to do that is because they have antitrust immunized joint ventures where they're actually, when you redeem a seat on Air France, um, it's technically Delta gets some of the revenue and vice versa. So that's how they, they've been able to weasel around doing this. Uh, and then Star Alliance, they've got a couple of like, you know, that's interesting. They have some partners that have a very high degree of leverage in their market. So they just do whatever the hell they want, like regardless of what the contract says, because what's Star Alliance going to do? And one example, it, there are two examples of that. One is Air New Zealand and one is Singapore. Uh, Air New Zealand makes no trans-Pacific uh, business class availability to any uh, partner programs. It's only available uh, to their to members of their own program. They make, you know, intra Australia and intra like Oceania travel available. They also make seats available to Japan. So, uh, you know, I, I'm able to get people sometimes from New out of New Zealand through Japan back to here uh, using Air New Zealand partly, but. They just, you know, like what are what Star Alliance going to do? Kick them out? In that region, they're the only Star Alliance airline, so Star Alliance has no leverage, and you know, Air New Zealand knows that. Uh, so the same with Singapore; they don't make their top tier products available uh, to partner members either. Any other questions? Does anybody want to book a trip right now? Have points they want to use. It's normally one forty nine per ticket. I do charge for this service, like you know. There's probably a hacker discount. Just tell me you saw my talk. Um, but if we do it right now, just so everybody can see how it works, like I'm, you know, happy to book a trip right now if somebody wants to take one. I just don't want to go like looking and, and get the answer. I have to ask my wife because uh, I know what that means. Um, it's like you know, book it now and ask her later. <laughs> yes. So you need. You need a, so you would need some points and you could tell me the balance and you would need to tell me where you want to go. Do you find that the most value is like international? Or yes. Is it you get good deals with domestic? But yes, you also can. Uh, ADAC is in the United States. Really expensive to go there. It's $1,717 round trip or 25,000 Alaska Airlines mileage plan points round trip if you uh, are flexible enough to book. Um, you know, so domestically, what do I use them for a flight that would otherwise be really expensive? Uh, internationally, almost always a great deal, but not always. Uh, there's some really cheap fares to Europe right now. Like, if you go in the winter, it can be under four hundred dollars round trip. So it's also cold. <laughs> uh, you know where I don't want to be in the winter? Minsk. Uh, yeah, I don't even want to be in Kiev, and it's much warmer there. So. And I love Keith. It's, uh, I don't know, like the you know the one thing that's really interesting is like I have never been to a cleaner country than Belarus. 
there is uh, there is one country I've been to that is as clean, and that's Japan. What about Singapore? No, no, even Singapore is uh, is dirtier than Minsk. It's kind of amazing. It's like uh, it's so clean there. <laughs> You had now? We done? Well, I was going to say, um, so here in this talk, it seems like these airlines are almost like countries. Like they build alliances, they have currency systems. Yeah. Um, so out of all the airlines you've worked with, what would you say the best ones are in terms of like hot value in their currency and alliances? I think Alaska seems to be one of those. And it's contextual. Um, okay. So the best all around, uh, especially for those of us living in the Pacific Northwest, is Alaska. Uh, okay. They have a really good mileage program. Uh, they have um, great partners that I can do a lot with. Uh, but you know, that's for how I travel. Keep in mind, I did go to Antarctica. Like I am going to Sri Lanka for fun. Um, I went to Myanmar like before the Civil War got really hot there. Uh, and I really enjoy like hanging out in in the you know by the statue of Lenin in uh, down the street from the KGB in in uh, Minsk. So um, you know for stuff like that, uh, and I I really love to go to like obscure places in Alaska, and, and of course Alaska points are great for that. So if your goal is to travel to Europe, Alaska points are not the best ones actually. Uh, those they don't have great partners to Europe. They have really great partners to Asia. Uh, and they have great partners to South America as well. Southwest is always solid. Um, Chase points can transfer to Southwest, so if you're gonna do a Southwest card, you can also do uh, Southwest with that. But that's for domestic, right? Uh, and those points are just worth a fixed value toward the price of a cash ticket, so the price will always be variable. Um, eh, Delta is not great points. Uh, they're consistently the lowest value. But there are some sweet spots. Like if you, if if like uh, like me, you love Taiwan, uh, then Delta points are the best way to get on uh, China Airlines to Taiwan. Uh, it's seventy-five thousand points in their excellent business class. Uh, I like American Express points a lot because they're super versatile and they go to Air Canada and also to Avianca Life Miles, which gets me the Star Alliance. And so, I really want to fly on the Hello Kitty plane. Uh, and you, can, you know, the EVA Hello Kitty plan, I just love Hello Kitty. So uh, that is totally achievable with those points, actually. Uh, so, you know, again, it just, it really, like, that's why the flexible points currencies are so good. Because, you know, if where I want to go isn't the same place as you. So if you get those flexible programs, then we can transfer to whichever one makes the most sense for the destination you want. Uh, I don't know the number of countries I've been to, but uh, you know, having visited all seven country, uh, continents, it's a lot. Uh, what, I, what personally motivates me is going places most Americans don't see. Uh, because the more of the world I visit, uh, the more, I'm, I'm sure you know, people ask you all the time, Belarus, what's that? Where is it? Um, or they think it's Russia. Uh, or um, maybe they have some impressions that are like from Soviet Union versus now. And you know, for me, I, I like to understand the world as it really is. And I think in every country and every culture, there's something very special. So uh, I try to, to experience that when I travel. Um, you know, most people haven't been somewhere like Myanmar, uh, but it's one of the most ancient centers of Buddhism. And I've been to some incredibly special places there that most people never see. So, you know, to me, that's really special. What's the story with Antarctica? How was that? Tour, uh, world tour. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, so, Hikari and uh, Tim put together like a tour to Antarctica, and it was like we had a bunch of hackers and a three D printer, and uh, <laughs> we. Actually, took a so the the fun story is uh, like most of the boats that go down there are old Russian icebreakers. Right. Um, the first the first uh, Antarctica tours were given by like after the Soviet Union fell. There was uh, in the very far north uh, there was a Russian uh, icebreaker spy ship, and the captain didn't know what would happen, so he just took the crew and went to Argentina, <laughs> and uh, they gave him asylum. And then you know he's like, well, I have an icebreaker. Like let's start running tours to Antarctica, and that was kind of how it started. 
So that was the first one in Ushuaia, and there are uh, now, I think, three Russian crews of, uh, of icebreakers. The one that we went with uh, was a Norwegian crew and a Norwegian ship, because uh, you know Norway, there's a lot of ice as well. So it sounds like you didn't go to like McMurdo Air, Air Base. No, we didn't go to McMurdo. Uh, we didn't go to any US bases, actually. They are not friendly to visitors. Uh, so we went to a Ukrainian base, uh, Academic Brunatsky. Uh, and uh, got to have, like, they actually make Ukrainian vodka there uh, on base, uh, and they're allowed to drink, which is, is not the case in most of the Antarctic bases. So they were, like, super friendly. Um, <laughs> and we were there at, like, 8 in the morning, and they're like, well, ha drink vodka with us, you're here anyway. Uh, and so, and we had it, oh, it's so smooth, it was like potato vodka. It was, like, some of the smoothest vodka ever, because they make it with, uh, with glacial ice that's thousands of years old. It's incredibly pure. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's really special. And uh, they let us send postcards from there, too. So I got them, like, at the end of the season when the... Uh, when the Ukrainian Air Force came to get them, uh, they took all the mail and like sent it from Kiev. So I got it, you know, a couple of months later. Um, and we visited. A, so Chile considers Antarctica part of their country, uh, and they have some military bases there, which are for research, but really they're military. So we visited uh, two of those. Argentina has done the same thing, but uh, they were having big financial problems at the time we were there because uh, it was Christina Kirchner's. Uh, regime, and uh, so they all of their bases were mothballed, and no one was there. Uh, we visited also a British base. Um, they've got a, and they have a gift shop. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of fun. It's like how many visitors do they have? Uh, most of the cruise ships stop there because it's like that's one of the ports where the bigger ships can go. Wow. Uh, we had, we were in a small ship, so you know Vernadsky doesn't get very many visitors. Any other questions? Anybody want to book a trip? You don't have my passwords. So you don't have your passwords? We can reset them. And then we can do it right in front of everyone, and they'll all know your password. That sounds like a great idea. Well, so where do you want to go and how many points? Because I can look for availability in the programs that you have. We don't actually have to do it with your program right now. Uh, well, um, I mean, the point is just basically to give everybody a demo of how this works. Uh, I use a combination of tools, and that was kind of the point of the uh, demo. Is I could, uh, I could let you guys do that. Um, oh, there we go. All right. Twelve eighty by eight hundred. Oh, do I have to change this? Okay. How many points do you have? Me specifically, or somebody else? No, okay. you want to go somewhere, right? I couldn't say. That. I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, that looks a little better ish, is it? No. I'm going to do that. Uh, can I do. There you go. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so that's been all crappy. Um, yeah, where do you want to go? Okay, well, let's, I mean, I don't know if I have enough points. Let's say I have 80,000 points and... In what program? In Delta. And where do you want to go? And I need to go to Australia for us at college in June. You have enough points to do it in economy class. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Delta chart, although there is not technically a chart, is 40,000 points each way. Uh, we can guarantee 40,000 points each way in economy class if we book on Virgin Australia. So um, let's go take a look at Delta's site and see what we can maybe do. So we're going to go from Seattle, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll start by looking from Seattle, but we might be able to do a couple of tricks. Yeah. Uh, so, where do you? Where is Osecton? What city in oh, Australia is it in? Sorry, it's in Melbourne. Okay, so we'll pick that, and we're going. So, what I do always to start is I search one way. When is Osecton? Do you know? Let's say June tenth. I can't remember. Okay. 
Oz, Sakcon, OZ. Of course it is. Do you want to go the 10th? You'll get there the 11th. Yeah, because it starts on the 14th. Okay, so we'll look for the 10th. And the uh, so I can already tell you based on when, that, when this is that you should probably spend cash and not points um, because June is off peak for going to Melbourne. It's cold, it snows sometimes. So um, the weather is complete crap. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, not so much because it's like it's dry. It's fairly ish. It's like, I don't know, are you from there? Yeah. That's why I'm going to Christmas Island in, in, in September because it's. Uh, no, because it's hard to spend delta points uh, and get any good value from them. So it might be worth burning them anyway. Because remember, sitting on points just means the value will go down. And uh, what's the best uh, US airline and points to travel into Europe? Uh, the one with availability. Because um, okay. it's hard to get to Europe. Is that, you know, Americans are always traveling to Europe and they only travel to the same few cities. It's, it's so boring. They go to London and like some Italian cities and Paris uh, and maybe Berlin. Uh, and that's it. Like, oh, Barcelona is a big home. No, it's a, it's a place where Europeans love to go, but uh, not so many Americans go to Barcelona. Like uh, even Madrid, like they speak Spanish. That's scary. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's like, London, Paris, from. So what's the best airline to get to Barcelona? I, w I was just there this December, by the way. You want to go to Barcelona? Uh, American flies there through, um, well, the best airline. Iberia goes to Barcelona. That's a good way to get there. Uh, you know, it's using points specifically. Like, what, what I think when you say, hey, I want to go to Barcelona is, Okay, if you want to spend points to go there, it's going to be thirty thousand in the economy or fifty-five thousand on up to like seventy thousand in business. So, going to Barcelona, the first thing that I would recommend is when you're flying that direction, that's an overnight flight, so you may want to optimize for business class. And then when you optimize for business class from Seattle, there aren't a lot of options, you know, because there aren't that many flights from here to Europe in the first place. You've got British, Air, British Airways, Lufthansa. Uh, you have, um, what's that? Norwegian. Uh, no, Norwegian doesn't go, they dropped Seattle. Uh, you have Aer Lingus. It's seasonal. Yeah, it's seasonal. You've got Aer Lingus, uh, the new flight to Dublin, uh, and you have, um, Finnair doesn't come here yet. Uh, they're, they're, they've talked about starting service, but haven't. Uh, there's Condor, uh, and there's Iceland Air, right? So there to just fly to New York, and then you have many more options? Yeah, but then you're flying on a shitty like recliner product, and you don't get a good night's sleep, because it's only six and a half hours from, from uh, New York to, to a European gateway, right? So what I try to do is get people from the West Coast so they get a good night's sleep. Uh, but from Seattle, there's not so many options. So you know, it's always a series of trade-offs. Uh, I had one hacker client uh, who wanted to go to uh, Europe, uh, Italy, and what we ended up doing was even though it cost more money uh, to do British Airways using Alaska points, uh, you know, he had to spend quite a bit of cash to be able to get those flights because of the co-payment that uh, BA requires. I was able to get the flights nonstop to and from Seattle. And so that had enough value in getting, in basically being able to extend their trip by two days because they get a good night's sleep uh, and can arrive fresh. Uh, and they got a free stopover in London, which they wanted to do. So, you know, being able to get the free stopover in London, being able to get a, an extra day out of the trip, you know, that justified the investment. So it just all comes down to you, right? Um, for you going to Minsk, Lufthansa because it's Seattle, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Minsk. And then we would just focus on anything that gets you there, which would be chase points transferring to United generally, or anything that transfers to Avianca Life Miles. Makes sense? So, and I assume you'd want to go to Minsk? I haven't been there since 98, since we kind of left. <laughs> uh, it probably hasn't changed much. Uh, was, it, was it as clean then? Uh, yeah, it was. I've been back a lot to Russia and Ukraine, but not to those specifically. So actually, oh, Ukraine is so much dirtier. Like, 
I do want to go this summer back to Minsk, especially now that it's 30 days visa free. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, you got a U.S. passport? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's just so. Uh, it's so clean and pristine. It's a showcase city. So it's uh, you know they're like dictatorships are nice places to visit usually. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you want to go to Barcelona? Yeah. So that's, yeah, let's do that. April 12th? Yeah. So you'd need to leave the 11th because yeah, it takes a. Whatever, like, well, it starts, you'd actually probably, it's better to leave the 10th. Yeah. If you leave the 10th, you'll get there the 11th. But right. then going to Europe, you'll be kind of trashed. So you'll want a day to recover before you, uh, you know, shift into con mode. Let's see what they've got. It's also not usually so expensive. Oh, see, look at this. Here's a great example of, of a terrible deal. Yeah. Uh, 78,000 points in economy class to Barcelona. Uh, so you know, here's some examples that I look for. What's it cost to London? Because you know, just get to Europe is the key, right? not necessarily to the city where you're going. So we'll, we'll try to hack this a little bit. Let's see if we can find you. Oh, look what wow. happened. A third the price. So That's actually, Seattle, London is 25,000 points. That's a pretty good deal. Was that one way or one? That's one way. Because okay. uh, I always search one way at a time because you don't want your search to be like influenced by what the return is. Um, so we start with, but if we book this for real, then we will book it as a round trip once we find the day that you're coming back. And the reason why we'll do that is because there's another hack where if you originate in the United States, fly to Europe and return, you don't pay the European tax on the way back. You, the European fuel surcharge, rather. You, uh, you only pay the actual tax. So uh, yeah, OK, so Seattle, Atlanta, London. So this is, this is a pretty good deal. Uh, they've got you know, economy fares. Um, for 25,000, lots of different options to London. Uh, so, so these, and these are on Virgin Atlantic on the way over. So you're going to be going. Are these number? Are these the point numbers proportional to the actual like dollar? I mean, is that flight? If you just look at the price of that flight, is that like a third of the cost? Is it with, with the Barcelona? Oh uh, no, how, it how totally you, isn't. Like it's actually how if we come up with the, the scaler. Because it seems like that kind of like how do they come up with it? Between the between those is kind of where you could find some. So how do airlines come up with their pricing? Uh, they have the, a well, pricing versus the the points pricing. Which yeah, exactly. Cash price versus, versus point points. Because because you're I mean if the plane if the plane flight is you know half as much but then the points price is a third as much right like why would why would they just make the points proportional to the, to the cash price? Great question. So we have three kinds of points. A lot of cash prices. Yeah, I totally get it. Uh, so we've got three kinds of points in play, and I didn't get this in the talk, so let's, you know, I'll outline that for you guys. The first type of point is one that just goes as a fixed value toward a cash fare. And a, the most popular example of that is Southwest Airlines uh, rapid rewards points. So you go look at a fare on Southwest, and you click pay with points. And what it does is it does a calculation at a fixed redemption value, which is usually 1.6 cents uh, for an advanced purchase Southwest Airlines rapid rewards fare. Uh, and so like that number of points will just be like the dollar value divided by you know 1.6 and it'll be that many points. So that's option A. And there are you know rapid rewards spend that way. Chase ultimate rewards points can be spent that way as well toward fares listed on Expedia. Because they partner with Expedia, you can go search for any fare. That's how I got a fare on Bolivia, because uh, Bolivia lists their fares on Expedia. Uh, and so you can go search for a flight, and it'll price out just as if you bought it on Expedia. You're just paying with points at a fixed value per. So that's the first type of airline point. Most points aren't like that. The second type of airline point is the most common, and that is a fixed uh, chart. And so what that is is there's an award chart. And if you're going from point A to point B, point A might be in North America and point B might be in Europe. And so like wherever you're going in the Europe region as defined by the, the airline, 
uh, from the North America region as defined by the airline, and that may or may not include Alaska. Uh, you know, and this, this is kind of fun with hacks too. Like there are some chart hacks where, for example, if you're going from Hawaii to the Caribbean, it's in the same zone in, uh, on the Avianca chart. So it's ridiculously cheap to go from like Bermuda to like Honolulu. <laughs> but, because, um, you know, they're, they're not very good at geography at Lufthansa, <laughs> or pardon me, at Avianca. Uh, they, they also put like Minnesota in the same zone as, uh, as like, um, in the, sa the same zone as California. So like flights between the two are really cheap, but then California to like Vegas is way more. It, it's just crazy, like the way they've done it. So, uh, but these are, you know, like however crazy the chart is, there is a chart and it's like fixed based on geographic region, right? And that's, those are the kinds of charts that I like to go places that are expensive to get to like Belarus. Because if you're going to Belarus, uh, it's, you know, there aren't very many flights there. So the price is really high. Uh, it's it's just you know it's one of those kinds of destinations. Um, so the uh, third type of chart is what we call a variable award chart, and that's what we're looking at with Delta. They they invented that category, and Delta is kind of this hybrid. So for their own flights, uh, they tr they loosely base the price on the cash fare of a flight, whatever they're charging. But for partner flights, so if you're spending your Delta points with a partner like Virgin Atlantic. Uh, or with Virgin Australia, like I spent mine, that'll be like a fixed value. Like that'll be a fixed chart. So that's why I picked London. I'm like, well, I wonder if Virgin has anything available because if they do, it'll be cheaper and it is. Uh, that's, that's a fixed uh, value at 25,000, right? So another question, well, how closely does that resemble the actual cash fare? Is this good value? Like, is it worth spending 50,000 points for a round trip to London in April? What are 50,000 points worth? Well, at one cent per point, at least $500. At 1.5 cents per point, 750, right? What's it cost to actually buy a flight to London? And then how does that compare with a flight to Barcelona? So let's take a look, Seattle to London. And when we search to London, I'm not only gonna search to Heathrow, the expensive airport, I'm gonna search to all of them so that we, you know, like Gatwick and the outlying airports, because sometimes those are much cheaper. Because when we're trying to compare the value of our points, we also compare that to what it's worth spending in cash. Make sense? Yeah. So uh, Seattle, London, what are our dates again? April, April 10th? 10th. What was it? April, well, the 12th is when it starts. So we're gonna do the 10th, and when does it end? The 15th or something? When do you wanna come back if you're flying all the way to, to London? Let's say Tuesday, I don't know. Tuesday, okay. Sure. Okay, good. And we're only looking to London because that's a cheap place to fly, yeah. but we'll also compare to Barcelona and see how much that costs. Because one really fun hack is that if you buy a really cheap ticket to like just anywhere in general in Europe, you can buy a relatively cheap internal flight, unless you're going to Belarus because it's expensive from any, you know, to get there from anywhere, even inside Europe. Um, the only cheap place it's to fly to Belarus from is Moscow. Because uh, it's part of the same customs union as uh, with Russia. That's, it's actually, flights to Belarus are treated as a domestic flight uh, when you're leaving from Russia. And also why you can't fly through Russia to get to Belarus, because you also need a Russian visa then. When you book your flight, don't, don't go through Russia, you'll need a Russian visa. Uh, so, okay, um, so what's it cost to fly to London? $485 in cash versus 50,000 points. So we're getting value for your points of less than 1.5 cents, well, less than one cent per point. Not a great deal. Um, you know, if you want a nonstop, well, the nonstop is 758. So if we can find the nonstop with your Delta points from Seattle, then that's actually pretty good value. But if you have to connect somewhere, it's not as good value. Like the the actual value of a connecting flight is somewhere under $500. Let's take a quick look and see what it is to Barcelona. I bet it's way more. Do you ever play with the, the IPA software stuff, the routing codes? I do. 
those aren't super meaningful in reality. Uh, so there's it is, a, it's better than skip lag, I guess that's what I've, what I've noticed. I've played around with that, but it doesn't. Have you tried it. booking stuff that you find there though, like yeah. actually booking it? Yeah, I've had pretty booked. Oh, okay. Good. Oftentimes I've had a call, but um, yeah, you can sometimes get away with it that way. Uh, so what, what he's talking about is like there's a so Google bought a company called ITA that does some really wonky like travel software that's plugged pretty closely into the computer reservation systems that the airlines use. I and you what Google Flights is built on, right? Mm, ish. Ish. Yeah, it's ish. Um, so that, yeah, kind of. Uh, that's a great way to compare it, actually. And so the, like, the, thing is, the thing with this tool is you can do all sorts of wonky, super advanced searches. What I found in reality is that the stuff that you can find there is while in theory listed and bookable, like you know, a lot of the time when you actually go to do it, it's, it's tough to make it actually happen. Uh, but if you have an American Express Platinum card, American Express Travel, when you call them up and like feed them exactly what you want, and the special codes you've given, they have the ability to do it in their computer system. So a real travel agent can actually like do, work some real magic stuff. How does this site compare to something like Kayak, where it's just like the same thing, different flavor? Uh, Kayak is owned by Expedia, and it's basically, a, you know, it's, it's just, all they do is search all the different Expedia branded sites mm -hmm. and make it look like there's a competition when there isn't really. Right. Okay. So, like, I mean, they do have like airlines and stuff. Yeah, they do. Like, well, Expedia is—they're based in Bellevue. They're yeah. the biggest online travel agency. They power most of what you look at in the travel space, and then the other big company that that powers most of the rest of it is Priceline. So there's yeah. like two big companies, and so then this gets everything. yeah. And so, like, well, what Momondo is—they just got bought out too. So, like, that's probably gonna—it's probably gonna get shitty fairly yeah. soon. But. Yeah, exactly. But Momondo searches all the tiny little like bucket shops and stuff. So there's like these really small, you know, online travel companies that are hard to find, uh, mm. and they search those. Like so, we've got a, and they also are pretty good at, at searching um, like mix and match. Like they'll do like you know multiple one ways and string them together, and that's why I like them. So cheapest flight using a combination of terrible airlines. Uh, that takes 25 hours to get there and 30 back to Barcelona is $620. But what is it? Remember, it was under $500 to go to London. So how much is it from London to Barcelona round trip if you leave the 11th and you come back the 15th? About yeah. the uh, I forget. Um, I think it was Expedia. Priceline bought them. So that's the other company. OK. There's like one other good one, too, right? Left them, besides Momondo? Momondo's the one I like. And I'll worry about replacing them if they're terrible. So OK. So for right around 700 bucks, you can get some pretty nice flights if you to um, you know, into Barcelona if you do like a one ticket to London and one ticket to Barcelona. Uh, whereas if you did a better flight, you know, on one ticket to Barcelona, it's quite a bit more expensive. But we're looking at $700. That's probably worth trying to, you know, save some money on, right? Um, you know, there's a train from, uh, from Madrid to Barcelona. I wonder how much it is to there. Yeah, there really is. So high speed train is like seventy euros. Yeah, not cheap. not cheap, exactly. Uh but if you wanted to go to Madrid too because there's some wonderful museums, uh then that could be worth doing, right? Don't go to Madrid, go to Tel Aviv. Uh, I love Madrid. Uh, Malaga is my favorite, but Madrid's great. What is? I I like Malaga the best yeah. in uh, Spain. Too, yeah. But uh you know, Madrid's nice. Uh, and Catalonia, like, of course I'm a fan of Catalonia because their top level domain is .cat, just like a word yes. .cat. Yeah. Me, me. Um, okay. So, 150 to, you know, saves you 50 bucks to go to Madrid uh, and leave from there, like, maybe that's worth doing. 
And this doesn't search the low cost carriers like the uh, EC Jets and Ryanairs. And if you check that, like I check the major airlines and then you know usually the discount is 20% to go on a smaller airline like, uh, like EasyJet. Um, I've always done like the Toyota and then taken Iberia over services. I mean, this all makes perfect Yeah, sense. and then also if I do search from all London airports, not just Heathrow, to Barcelona, yeah. I bet it gets way cheaper if we uh, open it up to Gatwick, Stansted, and uh, what's the other one, Luton. Uh, what's that? City, like London City Airport. I think they have oh yeah, London City as well. Yeah, that's included in the LON code. Yeah. It searches them all. So yeah, that gets our price down to a hundred bucks round trip, if you're willing to fly from Stansted outbound and Barcelona to Gatwick. So it's fifty bucks each way, and that's a usual intra Europe flight is going to be fifty bucks. So is it worth six hundred dollars? You know, so six hundred dollars is basically like what the cash cost would be from here. Um, is it worth 50,000 points? No, it's like a penny a mile, basically, unless you do the nonstop to London. So that's, I mean, that's kind of how I value it. On the other hand, like, what else would you do with those points? So. You don't get better values going from Manchester to Europe, right? Uh, not with Delta points. Um, Delta is good on Delta, uh, Air France, KLM. Um, well, I mean, we could see if they have a, like, there's KLM flies to Vancouver. Yeah, we so, Vancouver so. so we can check. Yeah, we can, alternate airports are a legitimate strategy, so we can see if Vancouver, London, there's anything. The tax is more from Vancouver also, though. It's like, it's, leaving the U.S., it's $5.60. It's always cheap to leave the U.S. Oh, okay. Well, as it turns out, um, if you go the 11th, you can get that nonstop, it looks like, to London. So I'll at least give you something to work with. Yeah. And then uh, you, can, uh, you can go from there. Thank you. Anyone else have questions, or do you guys want to go eat? Uh, oh, then follow the flight deal. Yeah, the nonstop's available the 11th. Non what? The nonstop to London's available the 11th. Book that with your points. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess you missed it. All right. Okay, good. Well, uh, yeah, so if you don't care where you're going, uh, there are two Twitter accounts to follow. One is Secret Flying, and the other is The Flight Deal. Uh, and those are the two that I used. There's a to get my cheap flight to Somebody Australia. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty nice. Well, what Secret Flying does is they subscribe to Scott's cheap flights and just tweet out everything he publishes, and um, <laughs> the you know, and they find a few other things, but they're just like they totally plagiarize from everywhere. Uh, don't give credit to anyone and publish whatever's there. But so I hate them because they're assholes, but they also publish really good deals. They also uh, amalgamate everything. Yeah, they also amalgamate everything, exactly. Uh, but generally speaking, when you're looking at cash cheap flights, you're not gonna be sitting up front. Like these premium products usually are not on sale. If they are, it's a mistake. Uh, there was just a giant mistake that Cathay Pacific had if you originated from Vietnam. So if you started in Vietnam and you like flew from there to North America, it was like $800 round trip. Uh, in first class, and it was a total mistake. Like they're, you know, they've lost like over a million dollars with that mistake, uh, and they honored it. So, wow. and whoever caught that, nice. yeah. yeah, whoever caught that, like, um, well, whoever made that mistake, like, I am sure they've uh, they have been corrected. Well. I'll still be here. Like I think I'll hit the barbecue with the rest of you. So if anybody else has questions, happy happy to dis, uh, to answer anything you might have. Google has an option to fly to Europe, so you don't specify the country. Uh, yeah, Google Flights actually does that too, and I think they're a little better. Like if you're like if you do Seattle Europe, they'll just search all the major European airports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Like, can you stop?